Good morning, everyone. I'm joined on stage by a terrific and very knowledgeable <coughs> panel. Um, David Abraham, CEO of Channel 4, still the only man to have named a channel after himself, still running. Um, Nick Southgate, former CEO of Shed, one of the early consolidators, um, then acquired by Warners. Um, Nick's just come back from helping to save elephants in Africa, and uh, so I'm hoping he will um, help us tackle the elephants in the room today. Uh, this is important too, though, obviously. <laughs> Uh, Tim Hinks. Um, I like elephants too. You do? Yeah. Good. Good. But I'm, I'm just quite busy at the moment. But otherwise, <laughs> I, would def I would definitely be doing that as well. Now, president of Endemol Shine Group, you get ever more elevated titles, don't you, Tim? I don't know, Lorraine, do I? I mean, is yeah. that, yes, yes, then I do. Yes, yes, I'll agree. Wayne Garvey, chief creative officer of Sony International Pictures. Um, so we're going to start off, rather than talking about what we were going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, Minister of State's, uh, Secretary of State's um, comments yesterday on the terms of trade, um, because I think we all thought that the terms of trade had, for the time being, been put to bed. Um, David, what's your view? Do they need revisiting? Well, I think what, um, what I found very interesting about what John Whittingdale said yesterday was he, he actually went back to the 2003 um, principles of the regulation and, and actually I hadn't sort of I hadn't kind of read that in that level of detail and with there were two or three principles that he set out um, and the first one you know was about the diversity of the voices uh, in the industry uh, and then there was um, uh, an objective around um, tackling vertical integration um, and uh, for us at Channel 4 you know obviously part of our remit is to um, stimulate and support, uh, the, you know, the regeneration of, of the indie sector. So we've always been supporters of, of, of those broad objectives, but we have called attention to the level of change that's occurred in the industry. Um, and, and kind of, in a way, my fear is that if we, if we don't have this debate properly now, then it might well be that with the further changes that are occurring in the industry over the next 10 years, you know, the, the, the the implementation of these principles become more and more problematic. So are you suggesting different levels of terms for different kinds of companies? I mean, already non-qualifying indies aren't covered by the terms of trade. Yes, and that's an argument that's always made, of course. But, you know, when you're running a broadcaster, obviously, you know, you're helping companies to grow and um, quite rightly um, they're benefiting from the terms of trade. You know, the, the point at which the consolidation occurs uh, means that those pre-existing terms often then last for a very long time uh, in the companies as they've been um, as they've been merged. But you renegotiate with the non-qualified. Not company. not backwards though. Not on the back book of the the shows that uh, pre-existing. So you know, even though, for example, um, uh, you know, shows will will could, could stay on our schedules for me, for, me, for many years even after the companies have been bought. That's a sort of rather more specific issue. Brought more broadly. We are absolutely of the view that we should continue at Channel 4 to do everything we can to support the small companies. And in fact, the growth fund is intended to do that, and that's uh, got off to a good start. I remember talking about that two years ago at Cambridge. Uh, but there's, I think there's more that we can do, actually, um, collectively, to, to help to stimulate um, the, you know, the regeneration of the industry. We're, we're a niche player. We can't solve problems for the whole industry, but we can focus on what we can do for small companies. I mean, Tim, uh, what do you think? You're running one of the biggest super indies, mega indies, whatever you want to call it, but you started off at Basel, which did benefit from the terms of trade. Could you have grown your empire without it? Um, I did have some help from Peter Bazalgette, um, I have to say, um, uh, which made it tricky. Um, but <laughs> I... <coughs> I, I would say David's done well to hide his disappointment about the announcement uh, yesterday um, from John. Um, I think that, um, I think that um, there's a case to answer, isn't there? I, 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 which is this, you know, the, the, the terms of trade are there, as, as, as David just said, you know, to, 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 you know, ultimately to allow um, creative people and creative organisations to, to have some, a fair share of what they create. That seems to me a fundamental self-evident principle. Um, and where we are now is that we have a number of smaller, medium-sized indies who are, who are you know, covered by the terms of trade. The bigger 
I mean, the, you know, non-qualifying indies are, are not covered by them, so there seems to be a very simple mechanism which seems to work very well. Um, we've all been enjoying the, some of the creative fruits of non-qualifying indies. Charlie Brooker's work just in, ahead of this session comes from Endemol Shine. Charlie's been with us for some time. It's non-qualifying indie. You know, creativity is alive and well in the bigger companies and in the smaller ones. I think where I would, um, my question would be, what's changed since the last of the five reviews that we've had? But everyone's open. It's very fashionable now for all politicians to be open-minded about everything. So uh, John said he was open-minded. I'm open-minded. Let's see where we get to. I'm not sure what the case, you know, what's changed. And secondly, I think there's a genuine concern about the smaller and nascent and medium-sized indies in the UK. What would be a real tragedy, I think, would be for this debate to be used as a smokescreen to hammer them, to make it a much worse position for them to be in. Because I tell you what will happen is the non-qualifying indies, the big consolidated <coughs> indies, will benefit from that. We'll become even more attractive. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that would, you know, I, I think it should be a more level playing field. So I think let's make sure this isn't a smokescreen as broadcasters attempt to um, face, the, face a difficult and uncertain future that they use this as a smokescreen in a way of, of hitting smaller uh, cr creative indies. That, that would be a real mistake. But I don't think any of the statements that, I mean, you know, going back to the McTaggart, anything that Tony Hall has said, we are incredibly mindful of those principles. And going back to your examples, Tim, about programs, you know, look, this is an ecosystem and we're at a critical point where we're trying to rebalance that ecosystem for a very changing future. And the examples you give are of shows that we all know came from the shared risk-taking culture of, the pub of public ownership and private ownership collaborating in this brilliant way. Um, we don't know whether or not Shine Endemol will be producing fantastic new ideas in five to ten years' time. That's an unproven uh, future that we will have sure. to discover. Right. Um, but what we do know is the system we've had has been brilliantly um, produ productive in creative terms in this collaboration between um, how the terms of trade have worked to grow these small, these small companies. But you benefit, I, I, you so benefit Nick, from the you, terms of trade as well, though. You receive, as Channel 4, a share of the back end. And what we know is when we talk to international broadcasters, when you sell anything abroad, whether it's a tape sale or a format, the broadcaster steps back and thinks, oh, okay, it's, you're British. You've got, oh, yeah, we get that. You're benefiting from that, and I don't understand why you would want to disturb yet, a, you know, something that is working so brilliantly well and has but done. We, I think this is the difference between reform and repeal, and I think that the initial debate up until now has been as if we are really saying let's just in the whole thing, and we have never said that. But if you break I, something uh, that has worked so well, you do it at your peril. I mean, I think you suggested but can't you, that... But can't you upgrade they, it? You suggested a two-tier system. Um, which I don't think will work because, you know, inevitably what will happen is you'll go to the cheaper supplier, which will be the bigger, not either non-qualifying indie or somebody in your higher tier. And that's not going to benefit the smaller people who you profess to want to protect. But there are very, uh, look, there are very legitimate and specific issues that will clearly be raised in the review that's now going to take place. But again, we're, we are a broadcaster that buys from 350 companies, and we do care about the overall balance in the system. We do care about, for example, that our schedule benefits hugely from one-off documentaries. I mean, last night at 10 o'clock, you know, the Lions of Rajava film, these kinds of dispatches films, they tend not to be made by companies that are, uh, you know, super indies, because they're not highly economic, but they are very important parts of how we develop our distinctiveness. I, th I think that's, and um, it sounds like we're moving on a bit, because that's a really interesting point. Because actually one of the things about this session, I think, is to think about how creativity works or doesn't work as companies get larger and more successful. And I would say, I mean, I agree absolutely with David, this ecosystem has been incredibly successful. I would argue quite strongly that creativity is not a function of scale, right? It may, it, sometimes scale can be a benefit, sometimes it's not. Some small, I can exclusively reveal, some small companies are terrible and some are really good. Yeah. Some big companies are terrible. So, so I, 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 this is going to be the interesting thing to, uh, to, yeah. to, to, to examine, I think, about whether you can have that. And actually, you know, some of the big groups do, do indeed make documentaries. Yeah, do. um, I, I'll give you one case study you could maybe start with, um, I'm suggesting. I'm not giving you an option, Lorraine. I'm telling you that's what we're starting with. <laughs> Thank you, I realise, so it's up to you, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, to take your, to take your point, you know, something like humans, or take two shows, humans and hunted, and I'm, this is very self-interested, they both come from the Shine side of Shine Endemol. That's a company, Shine, that's making two incredibly innovative, really interesting shows for you, David, and with your teams. And as you say, it's been a really interesting and brilliant cooperation between the two. That's a company that's been American-owned for about four years. 
um, and owned by Fox. So I would argue that if we're going down a road whereby somehow being owned by these, these major American corporations is crushing creativity or there's the cold hand of the finance director or whatever it happens to be, the evidence just simply doesn't seem to well, support that. I don't think that's what yeah. you were getting at, David, no. when you um, made your McTaggart speech last year, which really kicked off this whole yeah. topic of discussion um, that's the main subject of our panel today. So, I mean, you were worried about increasing American ownership of British production companies um, and potentially broadcasters, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. last year. Have your concerns grown or decreased well, since you not, made that speech? Well, they've not decreased. I mean, if you think about the number of transactions that, I mean, we, the, the speech was made at a, you know, at a peak point of transactions that were occurring that year. Since then, we've had two major mergers in the mobile space. Um, we have continuing um, acquisition and vertical integration of, of companies, many of which Channel 4 has worked with over many years. So, you know, the, the problem in this discussion for us is that, of, of course, on a case-by-case -case basis, we can all come up with positive and negative examples. And by the way, you know, I hope we get onto some of the negative examples where... We've got time right. today. <laughs> <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, because they, they do exist. We've still got you know, 50 minutes, they, Tim. They do exist. But the, the, broad, the broader point was that if you combine all of these effects and you combine potential chain of change of ownership of some of the big broadcasters and, you know, in my mind, greatest concern, you know, that the, that the BBC's budgets are much more limited and that affects the ecosystem fundamentally. Um, all of those things coming together, we could look back in 10 years' time and say that this was a, a really important jun junction point, and let's have a, a grown-up conversation. And I don't think that the BBC and Channel 4 should be portrayed by anyone as wanting to walk away from the core principles of the terms of trade. I just think what we quite politely and modestly asked for was, was a grown-up discussion about whether they could be reformed and work for the next 10 years. The terms of trade? Yeah. But moving on to American ownership, yeah. How, how, have your fears materialised? I mean, have you noticed a difference with greater ownership of um, UK production companies well, by it, American it, in, companies? In general, we, we, d we don't know what the consequences are, but what we do know, and I think it was borne out by you know, the, the session with Viacom yesterday, is that we have a different <coughs> culture. You know, I think we've all, we've all worked and travelled in America. Uh, we all know that there's outstanding creativity there, but we do do things differently here. And the, the risk-taking appetite that is built into the not-for-profit public service system is a fantastic uh, fuel into the creative economy. And it is different to how things work in America. Americans are fantastically creative with a profit-driven motive. And the two things competing with each other is very, very effective. But let's not then wash away if all of this ownership changes to the extent that it would. We just don't know. A lot of these companies are saddled with a lot of debt. Um, you know, a lot of the share prices of a lot of these ownership com uh, uh, holding companies is under a lot of pressure that might create new issues that we've yet to see come through. Um, and, and bluntly, you know, I know that at the top of these companies, you know, financial uh, realities will, will come to bear. They just will. And it's, we're in denial if we pretend that creatively, you know, nothing will change, which of course is a hypothesis at this point is unprovable if we don't understand the broader structural challenges. I mean, Tim, you're bathing in the afterglow of a you know, takeover by a major American corporation. <laughs> I think your headquarters in Shepherd's Bush, you did show us, had, had changed a bit to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a, a, a joke I made at BAFTA, which <coughs> fun enough, was even funnier then than it is now. Um, um, but you, 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 did, you did it brilliantly, Lorraine. Um, the, um, but yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, I am indeed bathing in the afterglow, and I think there may be two ways of thinking about this, because I think to David's point, it may be that we think about broadcasters, broadcast platforms being owned by foreign, you know, foreign owners and so on, and creative, you know, c c content creators. And Endemol Shine is, uh, and then Endemol and Shine separately and now together, are content creation companies, right? We create content for our local market. And any hit we've ever had that's traveled the world has started off in the UK, or indeed our Dutch colleagues in Holland or whatever. And so we are, through and through, in the way I think about it anyway, a British company, right? I mean, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to keep re referencing Charlie Brooker, Brooker, but you know, you name it, whoever, you know, a number of British talents sit in, under our roof in Shepherd's Bush, and we create content for our local broadcasters. And for this, as you say, David, this absolutely fantastic, valuable um, uh, ecosystem, this, the, the PSB ecosystem, that has been so helpful and encouraging of creativity. And we think about it like that. So 
we are not, um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of R&D, if you like, doesn't suddenly go back to America and sit there. It's all based here. And we have a thousand, you know, British, uh, uh, you know, jobs that, that we've, we've created here. Um, and, and as I say, cr creative people in the UK making shows for UK but broadcasters. But Tim, the IP and, and the profits of everything you're doing are now held in New York, aren't they? I mean, that's the thing. We're great at television, but basically, the, you know, the actual ownership of the IP. I mean, I heard it's, I heard a phrase from someone I won't mention say that, you know, all of, all of the companies that are owned by one of these American companies, that's great. We now own an IP farm in the UK. They're good at IP, creating IP. You know, it's like, if that's the way we're thinking about something so culturally and economically valuable to our country, yeah. I think we're, I'm not sure we're letting is, go. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure that is how we're thinking about it, though. And I, I take you know, that that's, that's a separate example, as you say. But, you know, I'm not sure what that means in the end, the IP being, uh, because in the end, in, in the case of our company, in the UK, you know, the, the, the people who create the content, you know, are rewarded for creating that IP. We, we are free to use that IP as we wish. Um, we've been owned by many foreign owners over the years, right? And, and actually it's made no difference to our ability to create um, British content and original British content. I think it's just, you know, stepping back a, a second, you know, it's a success story, right? People are going to invest in, in successful British <coughs> industries, right? Not just in our sector, but that's what's going on here. And as you, as, as you and I have said, David, you know, we're, you're not suggesting trade barriers, right? So, so it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. So is it it's okay if basically all the IP ends up being owned outside the UK, even though we're so good at what we do. Is that, at what point is, is it not okay for you? Because obviously for your company it's okay, but if basically 90% or 95% of the production and IP of British television is basically not shored here, is that okay for the country? I'm just not sure that, how that, what that practically means in the end, because what, the way I would look at it is say, what we need and what, the way our company works, and I'm sure yours works, is that there is autonomy in the yep. UK, with, or Holland, or Italy, or wherever you are, and the, the management teams there and the creatives there have absolute autonomy to sell and, uh, their shows wherever they sell. They play the market. It's a hard market in the UK. There's a very small number of broadcasters and buyers, as you know, so we're, we're not, we don't have an advantage in that regard. But we, are, we, are, we push our content there, and the, and, and that, and the well, UK that, company I, has too, absolute autonomy and ability to do yeah. that. But the profits has, are returned to the UK. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I'm not sure what the... Well, I, I think there has to be a difference. I mean, Nick, there has to be a difference when you're owned by somebody else. There just has to be between being, you know, a UK indie where you call all the shots, you yeah. don't answer to anybody. You sold Shed to Warners. Presumably you were happy at the time to sell. It was an incredibly exciting thing to do. We, um, uh, I remember we did it in the autumn of 2010. We announced it at MIP. Warner Brothers put a tape together. Um, two creative powerhouses coming together. And there, there was this tape with our little stuff sort of next door to Harry Potter and uh, Casablanca and the West Wing. And, uh, <laughs> and that's thrilling for a creative person, you know, that you're <coughs> part of this legacy of, of brilliant program making. And essential to our deal, actually, was that what Tim was talking about. We had enshrined in our deal that we would operate autonomously for three years. Um, and they, uh, Warner Brothers were incredibly supportive throughout that three-year period. Um, I think the danger comes after that period, and Tim, you're not there yet, Wayne, I'm not so sure, but, you know, it's after that period when the inevitable integration starts to happen. Um, you've got to remember, these companies are incredibly successful companies, as they kept reminding me. Um, the, the, uh, <laughs> you know, I, um, I think at the time we were a, a top five indie, the biggest supplier, <coughs> certainly by value, to, to the BBC. And, um, and one executive at Warner Brothers told me, but Nick, remember, all of your output is only one episode of Two and a Half Men. <laughs> and there is a truth to that. You know, we're tiny. <laughs> we are tiny, you know. Just, just out of interest, why did you say yes? <laughs> <laughs> um, because he got a big fat check. Ah, ah, so I can save more elephants maybe. But um, no, it was the right thing to do. I mean, you take it back, we were a listed company following a ITV share price down the toilet. Uh, so we needed a, a, a home. Uh, and it was, you know, we need to work on your sales yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I sort of get it. Uh, I'm in. It was a creative <laughs> hope. Look, I'm, and I'm saying they were a great part. They were great partners and are great partners. My warning is that you know, leave us or leave um, the UK creative 
people to do what they did brilliantly. Do, don't lose sight of, the, of why you bought us in the first place. Um, you bought us because we do operate in this brilliant ecosystem where quirky shows get commissioned, where risk is, is taken, where these, these, these funny little shows can flourish. And, find an, uh, an international audience eventually. And uh, uh, if you break that by trying to, you know, it's understandable when you're so successful that you're gonna come and try and do things better. You know, because you, know, you are so successful, why, don't, why, why can't we make you more, more successful? But what they don't quite get is, is this landscape that we work in. And that's the danger for me of when that integration starts happening. But by the way, well, I give me think... some concrete examples of, of what actually happened. Because in a way, Warner's is so huge and yeah. Shed, relatively speaking, so small. You'd think that you'd hardly move the dial for them. So yeah. why don't they just leave you well, alone? You know, they, I mean, look, I don't want to be rude about Warner Brothers because they're fantastic partners and they are great creative people. But you know, there is a danger that I think they call it siphoning off uh, in the industry. But there is a danger. In, in, in Shed, we had essentially three units. We had a, a UK production, US production, and IP generation. <coughs> and US production, high margin business, um, does very well, very profitable. IP generation, even higher margin business, um, very profitable. UK production, low margin business, all the cost sits in the UK. So what happens inevitably is your US production gets hived off into the US, your IP gets hived off into the distribution um, business, and what you're left with is a low margin UK production business where all the cost, all the development is sitting. And the danger is, and wouldn't it be tragic if it did happen, that um, you know, some accountant somewhere is gonna look at that UK business and say, well, why is that not making any money? And they're gonna cut costs. And where are they gonna cut costs? They're gonna cut costs in development. And that's the danger because you, 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 you separate these things at your peril. But I, w I would only say, Larry, that I absolutely recognise that, and I think that's, it's really interesting hearing that. I think you could have exactly the same argument about an entirely UK-owned company. Yeah. In other words, it's about good and effective management of a creative business. I don't think that's about foreign ownership or, or, or domestic. I think it's about how well you protect your creative process, how well you protect your creatives, your ability to do that. And as I say, you could, be, you could, you could describe exactly that picture in a badly run uh, UK-based indie, right? I mean, it's about how but you... But if you're you... talking about protecting your creatives, Tim, I mean, Endemol Shine has hemorrhaged talent since the merger. And first of all, it's a bit it looked. Harsh. I've missed the new. I've, I've missed that one. A lot of key. A lot of key creatives have left. First of all, it looked like it was an end of the rain. We would love to have you on board. It's just. <laughs> it's just. I just think we need to talk privately, but it's just not the right place to discuss it. <laughs> But first of all, a lot of people left Shine, and it looked like it was an end of all takeover of Shine. But since then, some of your key creatives, people like David Flynn, um, people like Jane Featherstone um, from Some people Kudos. like them, actually them. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those people yeah. have left the company just at the time that it created this, you know, right. mega merger. No, and I think, look, I think... Doing something on the scale that, that's you know been happening at Endemol Shine is there's no question. Before it started, you think people are going to people are going to go, people are going to come. There's going to be a round. I mean that, that's not remotely surprising. I don't think. I think genuinely you can sit back and think when you're going through a big change. There's you know there's going to be some some losses and some of them you'll regret and some will be part of the way, way, and way, way isn't it works. Isn't that why it works so well? Because actually the, you you can portray these consolidation these terrible monolithic companies. Actually, creative people just leave. If they, if they want to do something different, they do, and they're not exactly. held back. And, that, and that's what's the, the brilliant thing about it. And again, I you go and work in the environment that is right for you. And that, again, is not about, if, to my mind, it's not about consolidation and, indeed, by extension, foreign ownership. That's just about the every day. You know, every day we're trying to hold on to the best creative talents, right? And that's what we do for a living. And, and yeah, some people go and some people stay. So I don't, I don't think but that... There, there are still... The is, yeah, I think the, yeah, yeah, sorry. I think the danger is that, you know, the, uh, the, essentially the you know, 21st century Sony, Warner Brothers, these are distribution companies, essentially. They're not creative companies. They have to um, feed their pipes. And I think, you know, inevitably, they want to feed their pipes with international content. Yeah. And the, the pressure that comes down from above is to develop that in what they perceive as that international content, not necessarily oh, what yeah, we you know, have proven. Can, you know, who would have thought that Gogglebox or Who Do You Think You Are or you know, whatever. They, but you know, that's the why the would... American companies are interested in British. Uh, this idea that somehow they want to buy the British companies and then transform them into American companies is, in okay. my experience, Okay, but can I, can I read you something? So, 
Um, I don't quite know how this happened, but I, a headhunter was looking for some advice <laughs> Did you get it? for <laughs> a job. Now, this is a job for the global head of content for a major US-based media <laughs> company, right? And I'm not going to say who it is, but I'm going to read you... Would you give us their initials? No. <laughs> nice try. And this is, a, this is a job that's in the market right now. And interestingly, there's a lot of introduction about the company. And the first thing it says about the kind of qualities that they're looking for in the global head of all content in a creator is, or a yeah, broadcast well, well, platform. I mean, this is, it's, so a, it's a major media company. It's a black, black major media that owns, company. That owns a lot of content. It's a platform. And, it, a platform. and it, it may or may not own. And the first thing it says about this person is that they should, ha that, 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 that they should, they should have no ego. Egos are not tolerated in the company at all, which, of course, in the creative industries is a little bit hard. Well, you have it, then, it, then, it, then says, it then says, major key objectives, drive year-on-year -year savings on content right costs, including synergies from group-wide acquisitions, uh, create value from these investments, and contribute to overall business margin group-wide and by country via astute financial management of the content function. Now, well, that, much, that, is the, that is the reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the reality of what the, all of these mergers and acquisitions are heading to in business terms. I absolutely accept that what for you, your, as a brilliant well, creator, it's, it's not, it's is not that an issue, your but that's world? where it's at. That's heading. not my world at all. I mean, this is quite interesting. I'm a bit upset, Tim. Have you been approached about this? I, I, I don't know what the holiday pay is. It might be your job. So, I mean, it's. I'm flattered. Doesn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't sound like it's been a very thorough search if none of us have been approached. No, I think that's a broadcast platform. And I'm, I'm not trying to push you because you're not. But I think that's no, a they own a lot of content creation. But that's a not lot. a content creating company along the lines of Endemol Shine or all three or whatever. That sounds like a sort of fun. I'm, listen, we don't know because you're understandably not going to say what it is. But, but you, know, you can find jobs like that here, right, in the UK, where people are, you know, and again, I, I, I come back to the fact that, you know, how you effectively manage a creative company is, is all that matters, right, and, you, and, and some people are good at it and some people aren't good at it, some Americans are good at it and some, some aren't, and I, 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 I think that the worlds we're in, you know, that where, where we, you know, where every day we come into the office, right, and, and yes, sing the Star Spangled Banner, but then, <laughs> um, but having... <laughs> Having done that, um, <laughs> we, we, we think about what we're going to create for, the, for, for broadcasters like Davis Broadcast in the UK and in Holland, they're thinking you know, about what they create for RTL and so on. And I've had ownership, you know, I've been owned by many different people, yeah, right? Of many, different, um, <laughs> many different um, flavors. And you know, there are good owners and bad owners, and I'm extremely happy to talk about the good owners. And, um, <laughs> and, I, um, and, and, and it's about how they manage you and how you manage them. I think how you manage your owners is probably, again, the, one Tim, of the most fundamental But Tim, how much debt did Shine, did Shine and Endemol have when they came together? I mean, you, you, we've got to also deal with the business realities that sit behind these mergers. I mean, it, it is a lot to do with the amount of you know, of, of debt sure. that, sit, that sits there. And, I, I, and, I, and again, I think that that's, you know, debt and creativity are, are not great bedfellows. Uh, and, I, and I think it comes back to how the public service broadcasters, uh, with their not-for-profit models, are able to keep stimulating such a high level of creativity with the great creatives in, in the independent companies. I think it's this brilliant partnership and marriage that we've got to preserve the health and, and, the, and the, ec the underlying economics of it for, for, the for the whole system. I mean, in a sense, we, we get to a point in this debate where we're talking at cross purposes. I'm really talking about the ecosystem. We've got, you know, the head of Ofcom sitting in this room. We had the Secretary of State yesterday. These are the people who are making really important decisions about the future ecosystem that we're all going to hopefully benefit from, and most importantly, that the viewer will uh, benefit from and enjoy watching this great content. David, David, that, that's really what we're, well, we have to come back to. Well, what's going to happen with these indies that you've invested in, who at the end of three to five years, when they want to realize the value they've created, and you, you want to return, yeah. you want to reinvest it. What, what's going to happen when they want to sell to a consolidator, an American consolidator? That will be entirely their decision. Um, and you know, what we did find so you when could we research... Benefit, Channel 4 would benefit from that. Yes, and, and then we'll okay. put that money back into helping the next, so, the next okay. wave coming in. And, and, and that's us swimming with the tide of how the market I, I, is going. But what I can tell you is that it's been an amazing journey for us to sit with uh, you know, 
the startups and, 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 and the different kinds of companies that we've become involved with, actually, you know, with, with some great advice to people like Lorraine, and actually understand what it's like to get from the kind of, you know, one to two million turnover, the guys who everyone wants to help, to the sort of 10 to 20 to 30, where they may start to play in the league that you were playing in. And that journey, we know, is incredibly long and hard. And um, we at Channel 4 really want to help those guys go on that journey because it's perilous. You know, you do need extra capital. Banks are not there at the moment to help uh, on decent terms people to expand their capacity. Uh, and that's where there's a gap. And I, I think we're filling it really well with the growth fund. And I'd like to keep, keep investing in the growth fund. And if we do make returns, we want to reinvest those and make it as, as useful a, a, a fund as we possibly can. But Wayne, that's a similar thing to what Sony's do doing, really. You're, you've also backed yeah, quite with, a lot with, of I, I startups. Yeah, I was in Belfast yesterday, about 18 months ago. Two young guys who I didn't know actually came to me. They were working in Ireland, and I liked them, and I thought they were really imaginative, and I liked what they talked about programs. And we, we thought there aren't many indies in Northern Ireland. It would be quite good to do something in the nations, and we invested in them. And their first, and I said to them, I don't want you to develop many shows. I only want you to develop two or three shows in your first year. The first thing they developed uh, is a physical game show, which they had ITV and the BBC were both really, really keen on, and eventually went to the BBC, which has been great. And in Northern Ireland, <coughs> we just produced. Well, yesterday we, we were just producing the American pilot. So, what, what's happened there? And, and this is this is the point in the real world that we live in. It's all about. You, you can be scathing about distribution. It's all about distribution because, as Nick says, you cannot run a British production company on the margins basis anymore. So, consequently, you, you've got to work with people who can take your IP and take it around the world. You know, I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently about the Crown, which is obviously something. Uh, uh, Left Bank is a Sony company. Uh, what, one of the interesting things about The Crown is, is that the deal we were able to do with Netflix was as good as it was because at the same time the studio was negotiating two other deals with Netflix. So consequently the deal we got for Left Bank was beyond our wildest dreams and you can only achieve that if you're part of a, a big and strong muscular distribution outfit. I think there's another interesting area related to that, which is about the notion of risk and risk taking. And again, David's very much is absolutely right in the way that the, the, the ecosystem as it stands, you know, and, and, and has been a really interesting, you know, the UK has almost stood alone as a place where risk taking, you really can do it, you know, and, and broadcasters are prepared to take ideas, you know, off in, from a conversation, let alone off a piece of paper. And so it's been a really interesting place of risk. We know that system, you know, I passionately believe that system needs defending and bolstering, but we know at the same time, the realities are it's under pressure. The question for me is, you know, are the bigger, you know, is there, a, is there an argument you can run, I believe there is, that the scale that you get from some of the consolidated in it allows, also helps foster that risk taking for British yeah. creatives. And I, you know, I can only say from my experience, and having been, you know, owned, you know, as I say, foreign owned for, for many, many years, uh, and part of a big company with a global presence, you know, being, if you like, in some sense protected, right, from the, exactly what David was talking about, which is, you know, the, the really, you know, marginal decisions which between success and failure when you're very small, um, being protected from that after a certain point can, in the right hands, allow you to take more creative risk. We, we've invested way, quite... I was yeah, going to we, say, we've invested, we, exa we've invested quite a lot of money, depending on the in our online digital video um, operations, or both, both here and around the world. Now, that's a real risk. It, there's no proven um, return on that. It's, it's, it's money we may never see again. Let's see, but we're working hard to make sure we do it. It's, it's, but it's a new area and so on. And I don't, we would not have been able to do that if we didn't have the scale uh, and, and if you like, almost the comfort of, of being a part of a large organisation that could take risk. And that's a really exciting story for us and our UK companies yeah. uh, as we move into that area. So. Nick, did you find that you had more risk capital as uh, a result of the Warner deal? I think uh, yes, to a degree, but I think there, um, there was pressure and is pressure. I mean, remember I left a year ago, but it, there is pressure to, um, uh, to develop for the pipes and to develop an inter international uh, formats and there is uh, you know a lack of understanding of our market um, which is inevitable you know let me just uh, I'll just tell you a quick story just before I left I, um, I, um, 
I was on a, a, a conference call. We did, did these regular development conference calls and um, where you pitch in uh, your latest shows. And uh, we had a, a new BBC Three show and a new Channel Four format that we were, were excited about and pitching in. And, and if you, you know, we did Don't Tell the Bride on BBC Three as a big show. You know, we did, obviously did Super Nanny on Channel Four and many other great Channel Four shows. Um, so quite excited about this call. Um, a new executive on the other end in Burbank. So we make the call um, and we start and we say, right, we've got a Channel 4 show that we're very excited about. We've got a BBC 3 show that we want to pitch in. And there was just deathly silence. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, and then across the Atlantic came the words, Nick, I don't want anything with a four, a three, or a two in front of it. I just want a one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's an absolutely true story. <laughs> and I think it goes right to the heart of what we're talking about. That's, that's hilarious. So, I, Tim, I, are you I, honestly going to tell me that with all the different owners you've had, you've never been on the receiving end of story. that kind of... Um, no, I've got nothing remotely as good as that. Um, um, no, and, and no, 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 uh, oddly, no funny stories about the people currently employing me. But, um, <laughs> um, but, um, but I... I, I but I can, you know, but I, I, do, I do recall, you know, as I say, look, it, 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 I, I recall many years ago, just repeat, many years ago, a, um, a session with some bankers, um, and this, this goes to the point of, you know, in the, in the end, it's not so much, whether, you know, it's, it's all about how you manage your owners, right? That's my, that's my firm belief. But anyway, some bankers, and we sat in a room um, somewhere in Amsterdam uh, many, many years ago. I've said that enough, I think, many years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and we were talking about looking at Endemol's business and her, and obviously, an incredibly clever person, you know, guy from one of the banks, because they're very, very smart, these people, as you know, um, um, <laughs> sa said, um, look, look, this has been fantastic. Probably didn't say it's fantastic. In my mind, he did. And, and he said, look, I'm looking at the way you, you operate. And I, w what we've noticed is you have like a, a really large number, like a massive number of very, sm ultimately very small shows in financial terms, very small shows. There's loads of them. Then you have some sort of middle ones not, you know, a few more, but, but, but not, not many of those, but, 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 but sort of middle ones, but not, not many who make a bit of money. And then you have a really small number of very big shows that make a lot of money. Now, Tim, <laughs> ha <laughs> have you considered <laughs> increasing, increasing the number of shows in that big money maker? <laughs> Switch. I promise you, I came this close to saying, actually, the woman that creates the big shows I fired last week, and now I realise <laughs> I literally can't believe I did that. But, um, but that, that um, shrewd observation, um, um, why did the crash happen? It's impossible to imagine why, why it ever happened. So, um, but, but the point there is, you know, frankly, how you manage that and handle it, how you answer it, sorry, I mean, this is obvious, but is, 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 it's all in the detail on those things. And you just, you, in a sense, you, you, you say, look, this is how we're doing things. This is how we're going to run it. This is why Channel, in an answer to it, this is why there's a four in front of it. And this is why Channel 4 is important to us. This is why BBC 3 was important to us. <laughs> this is, this is, um, the, you know, and, that, and that's the, that to me is the job. Right? Of, 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 of any, kind of, any proper uh, creative organisation is say, this is how we're going to do it. And I saw it the other way around, because when I was sitting in America running TLC, I, I, I saw all the American programmers just waiting for the UK overnights to come, because we were trying more new shows every night, on the BBC and Channel 4 in particular, which then, you know, the minute they worked, literally plane flights were being booked to come and pitch those shows and we are very good, particularly in factual, you know, been very good in entertainment. But it's because when you sit there in America and you see it the other way around, you don't see that level of risk taking happening every night in American television. So there's a, tre there's a tremendous level of, uh, of value and respect and, and potency to what we're all doing. And simply, I think well, the contribution we're trying to make to this debate is, you know, let's not sell the whole thing. Oh, and let's not, certainly not do that in a massive rush because that would be a tremendous shame, particularly if... I mean, the fact is that Channel 4 is actually spending more on original programming over the last two or three years. Um, so I don't think it's entirely accurate to portray the public broadcast as a sort of in decline. 
Um, but my goodness, are we still a huge, huge center to, yeah. to the investment versus the rest of the marketplace? And so we're all, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but we are really all in this together. But I think, I mean, David, are you worried about um, what will happen when broadcasters uh, are up for sale? Um, if Channel 4 were to be privatized uh, and bought by an American company, would that have more of a detrimental effect than, um, you know, because there doesn't seem to have been that much effect really so far from American ownership of Indies? Well, the, uh, the Secretary of State's made it very clear that there, there are no plans to privatize Channel 4, and equally importantly, he said that he really values and believes in the remit uh, of Channel 4, and he said that on various occasions in the last few weeks, so we're, we, we would completely agree with him on, on that. But I think, look, this is into the era of um, hypothesis. You know, what does the world look like if all of those cards fell? Uh, at, you know, I, ITV, you know, a different settlement for the BBC, and, and in, a, in a very sort of, I think, uh, hopefully unlikely way, Channel 4 as well, then, then you are in a really diff you're in a different country. And, and we really do need to wake up to the consequences of all of those cards falling in that way. Um, and it's pretty much what I said a year ago, I still believe it. I, I, you know, I'm incredibly proud of what this country is capable of doing. And I think we should, we should really work to preserve you know, what it is that makes us special. And let's not sort of, with all these slightly more specific arguments, sleepwalk into, well, we all say we love the BBC and we all say that you know, we think the system's really good, but at the same time, we sort of sleepwalk into this. And we slightly sleepwalk into it because there's a, there's a sort of a murder around being really honest about how different we are to the, to the cultures of American corporations. And then they, it's not that they are not creative, we are just different, and let's preserve what makes us different. Um, you know, I think well, when, I, when I walked out of the room yesterday, of the Viacom session, someone said that, well, he's a very nice man, but he could be selling cheese. You know, I mean, th th they're different cultures. We are, these are different cultures, and let's, let's, open, let's be open to that. But do you feel the same way about European owners or Chinese owners? I mean, you know, it just happens to be Americans, yeah, um, and, and some, look, some of the... You know, I've had lots of teasing about you know, being anti-American and all that, but no, I, I think it's much more about, you know, let's preserve what makes Britain great. You know, I, I think in other industries, you know, we, we have preserved the, the, the ownership. I think the tax breaks the government have introduced into production have been fabulous. They've really stimulated uh, a lot of jobs and we should support that. But at the same time, let's not lose this IP ownership uh, debate altogether. But the thing with the indie sector, in a way, is it's been incremental, you know, first one, then another, then another, and then we end up with 65% of the top indies or the, the most profitable indies being owned by Americans. If a broadcaster goes, if ITV goes, for example, it will be one big thing, one huge share of the market, you know, Channel 5 is only a relatively small share of the market, um, will be in foreign ownership, potentially. What, what would you feel about that? Well, if they're going to succeed as a broadcaster in a domestic market, they're going to have to create broadcast content that works for that market. So actually, you might find, actually, there isn't really any change for the viewers, which is the most important thing. But well, I think, isn't the most important thing at the moment the way it's regulated, the fact that we have a protected public service sector and so on, uh, whether ownership, you know, wherever it's based, makes a difference to that, I'm not entirely convinced. I don't share that concern. Um, I rather share, uh, what I do share is your passion and belief in this ecosystem we have. And I'm not sure that's necessarily at odds with ownership. And, I, and even if it is, I'm not sure what you do about that, as you say, because this is, you know, we're, we're now absolutely central to this, this global market pl pl uh, place. And these are the realities. Um, so I, I, do, I, don't, I don't share that worry. I think there is, you know, if we're talking about the tech, you know, ultimately here we are talking about some of the big tectonic shifts that we're facing, you know, they're coming together arguably, you know, um, uh, w w rapidly and at the same time. And, you know, there's another area we might look at here that's interesting to me in this context, which is about in-house. You know, and if we're thinking about the way the market's being, you know, some would argue distorted by the moves in, in, within house with BBC Studios, um, with, with ITV Studios. Again, you know, I'm, I, I broadly take the view that I'm, I'm again, in a, a state of high relaxation about that because I do believe that the best ideas win through and that people ultimately, um, uh, that, 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 that's, that's the way things work. But if you want to look at where the power is really being consolidated, you might want to look at in-house. And I, I firmly believe that in this country, the in-house experiment has basically failed, right? The in-house experiment is kind of over. We established 
that in-house is not the right way to think about creativity. It just doesn't work for lots of reasons to do with the odd relationship between the mothership and the, and the in-house and so on. So what's happened is, in the case of ITV, it's like, okay, well, let's buy up the indie sector. So that's our answer. Fine. I mean, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. And go to America and so on. And in the case of the BBC, it's sort of like, well, let's go, if you like, to the market. Um, and in both cases, there's an acknowledgement that it's not working. And that's a really interesting shift to the way things are going. And David, I don't know where you're plans that, you know, you've, you've well, got the Indies. Yeah, I made very clear a year ago, we have a never, um, you know, wanted to look at in-house production. That's never been on our agenda. Um, so there's nothing to fear from Channel 4 on that, on that, on that score. Um, but I think, I agree with you, going back to ITV, it's almost like what's the end game for ITV? Right. If, all, if all of that in-house production was fueling the, the sort of momentum of them as a standalone business, that's one thing. But if it is a means to an end for, for an international vertical integration, then the consequences are going, to, are going to be profound. But then you, you have the verti vertical integration that um, was referred to yesterday, really. Yeah, um, e e exactly. And, and the terms of trade debate yeah. becomes even more and it's, it's relevant. Also, it's also, but, it's also yeah, I'm going to open up to the floor, yeah. so I think we will get the lights up. Yeah. Um, and I've but Lorraine, there's just one thing I wanted to say, was that we, it's also worth remembering that the media ownership laws in the there UK are. are more open. They are more open than they are, even in some areas, to America. Yeah. So, whilst I'm not proposing that we should revisit that, it's also worth remembering that we are, that other countries do behave differently. You know, the, the way we are behaving is, is very open and it's very, very competitive, which is great. But, you know, even in America, they, they are, quote unquote, more protectionist than we are. So, to kick us off, I've got some Jeremy Corbyn type <laughs> questions from people on the app. Um, surely broadcasters like Channel 4 can choose from many truly independent creative suppliers if they don't want to use foreign owned. That's absolutely true, but, um, but you know, we're not here having a discussion just about the interests of Channel 4. We're having a, an industry discussion. We're having a discussion where there's being a, a PSB review, a charter renewal, a new government. Aren't we participating in collective issues here rather than the specific issues? Of course, that is, that is true. We follow our remit. Our remit encourages us to work with more indies, as many indies as we possibly can. We work with, uh, you know, as many as ITV and Channel 5 put together. So, you know, but that's, it's, that's, I don't think what, that's what this debate is really about. Are there questions from the room? Ah, from, oh, John, <laughs> first to put his hand up. If you could put your hands up, there's one at the back there. We can get a microphone up to the back as well. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, John McVeigh from PACT. Uh, David, you seemed to say earlier on that you welcomed uh, what the review that the Secretary of State announced yesterday. In fact, it was something that you and the BBC had been pushing for. Um, I'm a bit disappointed in that, given we've just been through a review, and yet again, the two publicly owned broadcasters seem to be lobbying against the interests of small private businesses. Um, <clears throat> but the other point you made, which I think was fine, let's have the review, let's see if the fundamentals of why the terms of trade were introduced remain appropriate. I think that's, that's fair and reasonable. Uh, but you also went to say for the next 10 years. So would you give us an undertaking, given we've been through multiple reviews over the past five years, that if Ofcom come to a recommendation that the <laughs> fundamentals remain true, that you won't be lobbying over the next 10 years for any subsequent reviews or changes? Well, it, look, it's not for us to um, define the calendar of regulatory reviews. Of, you know, my powers are limited in that, in that regard. I think I'd also like to take issue with how you phrase that, John, because, look, there was a legitimate call for all participants in the industry to comment on how the system works. We were not, you know, we did not invent a lobby here. We, we knew that there was a PSB review, and we were asked to comment on how the system works. You know, I think it's unhelpful to portray this debate as if we are secretly seeking to repeal the system and undermine the position of the small companies. It's a misrepresentation of anything I or anyone has said. Um, I am passionately <coughs> committed to, if anything, improving the condition of the smaller companies and the IP recognition that's at the heart of the terms of trade. But that doesn't mean, say, I don't think we should not look at reforming the system given all of the other things that have happened. So let's have, let's have a, perhaps a more mature debate about how to do that, because at the end of the day, I think we'll all be better off in 10 years' time. I'm just looking for somebody from the BBC, and I can see Val Samra um, <laughs> right in front of me. And I'm just wondering, Val, have you got something to say on the... Um, we'll get the microphone over to you. Have you got something to say on, on this, the terms of trade? No. <laughs> I think it, 
it's, um, I think uh, we can put ourselves in a position, we take positions very quickly, it, and um, I think we, I don't have a loaded kind of uh, um, thought around it at all, but it's, it's, it's right that you think about uh, the changing landscape. It's really been fascinating listening to uh, the characters on the, on the stage there. Um, and start to think about how this um, uh, this market is going to change over the next uh, next period, and it not to be considered to be a loaded thought process if somebody uh, is looking at any particular part of the ecosystem. So we should be we should all be a bit open-minded. I mean, I also believe, by the way, I think uh, it's really important that the the ecosystem of the UK does support and nurture new talent and new companies into the, into the, um, the whole ecology. Uh, I think that's really, really important. We need to find the right sort of system that sustains that for the future. I do. So, is the BBC in favour of revisiting the terms of trade? I said I'm not going to answer any of that. <laughs> I think, I think, I think, I think the, uh, it's interesting actually, when, when people talk about the terms of trade, there's, there's, it's about the business arrangements that you have with the different types of organisations that you work with. And so, I, it would be interesting to understand what people actually mean about the terms of trade. There's the rights, there's the amount of money we pay, there's the tariffs, there's the um, support that we give to uh, individual companies. It's quite a wide uh, topic uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to understand what people mean about the terms of trade. It's, a, it's quite wide, isn't it? My, my view, Bal, and we had this discussion before I left um, Warner Brothers, is that the BBC has already taken back everything from that, they, uh, 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 that we were gaining from the terms of trade anyway, because you were underfunding all our programmes by at least 10%. I don't know yeah. if that's still yeah, your yeah, experience. That's a really good point. That doesn't happen at Channel 4, but <laughs> really. <laughs> okay, question at the back. And if oh. you've got another question, put, uh, anybody else, please put your hands up. We'll get microphones to you. One over there. Yes, question at the back. So I'm Philippa Giles, Bandit Television. Um, took slight exception, Lorraine, when you said about the hemorrhaging of talent from Endeavour Shine, because when Jane left, it was just about the time when I was starting up with Endeavour Shine. Um, and a lot of people, uh, I think a couple of comedy startups have started since, since I joined, and very reinvigorated leadership, I think, with Diedrich and Dan at Kudos. So I would just like to say with Endeavour Shine, what I found is they're completely talent focused. And I felt empowered and recognised in a way that I never did at the BBC. And I think that we tend to forget that it's all about the management. I mean, there's inspirational management at the BBC. And, uh, that, sorry, at, at Endeavour Shine. I think what not, we tend to forget... <laughs> <laughs> what we tend to forget is that we as creators, and there are very few of us here in this room, need to be nurtured. We need to be sort of given a bit of attention too. And I think that that's what the debate today is sort of occasionally highlighted that for us to do our best work, we need to not know about bottom lines and all that. And, and in fact, when I came to Wendell Shine, never, nobody ever asked me for a business plan. I w was talking to a lot of other people at that time, and they all asked me about my business plan. I was never asked about that at Wendell Shine, and I found that absolutely amazing and very, very creative. So do you Sack agree with Tim, that. then, that yes, um, the days of in-house... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. yeah. Totally. That the, day, the days of in-house production are over? Well, I think the trouble is with the rounds of redundancies we see in the BBC to prepare for BBC Studios, all the entrepreneurial and people with a little bit more flair have left, because obviously you do, if there's voluntary redundancy programme, you take, you take those opportunities. So I think that the um, challenge that Peter Salmon will have will be to sort of make sure the people that are left feel wanted and feel, you know, kind of, uh, that, that, that they are great. And the BBC is not very good at, at that. So that's the thing, the challenge that he will have to meet, I think. And by the way, I think that... Um it's not about in-house being over. I think it just is looking for a new model. I think the experiment that yeah. you know, failed, right, ultimately, because in the end they didn't create the big hits and, 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 the, and the programs that, in the, in the, that the indie sector has been able to create. But it's about the fact that it's changing now. And it's, you know, in ITV's case, they're buying up the, you know, the indies, and in, in the BBC's case, they're going to the market and so on. That's, that's what I think is happening. Philip, I thought you read that out perfectly, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, the checks in the post. Is that meaning that? It's actually creating yeah. that environment, isn't it? Sorry, question? Yeah, so Ed Shedd from, from Deloitte. So just a, a, a wider point about US ownership, and, I've, and I love the session today. I mean, it was almost as good as the Viacom session yesterday. Um, is, that a, is that a compliment? Actually, I know, I know Anyone for cheese? I know that's a consultant trying to make a joke, so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I've... I've, I've liked listening to the debate, and I, and, I, and I loved all the anecdotes about, you know, US studios gone, uh, gone, gone bad. 
And I think it's just one point I'd, I'd make, because I've got a, a great deal of sympathy about the ecosystem point. But you know, there is, um, it's not all just about finance people um, trying to drive um, uh, in, increased margin out of content creators. Because if you look at the um, games uh, industry, you know, that's what a lot of the games companies have, have tried to do. And that, you know, Activision is a classic example where they invested in you know, IP factories in Australia and they absolutely destroyed those IP studios. So in one respect, you can say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm proving the, the discussion today. But, the, but the, well, what actually happened there was there was a big reaction from the market and in the management teams that actually uh, meant there was a big refresh of that, that, that team. So they were actually forced to focus on, on, on creativity. So I think, you know, being very, very polarised uh, in, in saying there's, you know, there's, there's kind of finance people from, from Burbank versus, you know, UK, UK creativity is, is probably taking it, it too far. I know, and I do probably agree with, with Tim, it's all about how you manage, you know, the, the, your, your owners and whether or not you've got a good or a bad, a bad owner. I mean, Tim, you have had lots of owners, as we've said. Have any of them made any difference? Attendable, <laughs> <laughs> or have you just, you know, have you managed to have such a strong culture within the company that? That's a really good question, but I think, and, and, and oddly, it's sort of hard to prove, isn't it? Because you don't know what you're comparing it with. But um, sure, no, like, I think they have made a difference. I think there have been different phases in certainly Endemol's life cycle. There was, as David was saying, you know, there's a period of great debt, sort of post 2008, when Endemol wasn't alone in that. So that that took a particular sort of owner. And actually, it was rather helpful then, to be honest, to have like the sort of the, the sort of private equity kind of owner and their view of the world, because that was it was a rather technical exercise. So, yeah, I think that, you know there've been different flavours and colours, but you know the truth is, uh, um, as Philippa said, you know, when you if you're working for if you're working for Endemol Shine in Holland, you basically your world is Endemol Shine Holland. If you're working in Italy, it's a US as you, and so on. Yeah, but and that's the how you think must about make the world. I mean, you know, one of the if, reasons people I, don't, I can finish people at some acquire, point, but. No, but one of the reasons people acquire companies is because they think they can add value to those companies. And, you know, you've had Dutch, Italian, Spanish, and I'm, I suppose I'm trying to get underneath your very slick replies into... Yes, uh, you're not actually going to manage that. Okay. But, um, but, <laughs> I had a go. But what I think is, therefore, if you're working and creating and making shows, your world is, is, is largely that domestic world, unless your show travels, and then that can be a fun experience. At the, at the sort of management level of the company, then of course you are interfacing and working with whoever the owner happens to be. And then I think it's absolutely about being, you know, what, what, is the, what in the end is the UK indie sector brilliant at? Best, that's just brilliant at being absolutely opportunistic, right? Entrepreneurial. So then you're using those same skills to think about how do we get the best out of this? Now, how do we use the money and the capital we've got to invest in, for example, online digital video? Or how do we use it to, to pay for pilots that broadcasters may not be? I mean, it's, it's about how you manage that. But we process. need to go back to genres as well, because a lot of the globalization right. is sort of quite genre specific. And, you know, whether it's news and current affairs or comedy to some degree, there are, I mean, I, I hate the phrase market failure because I think it, you know, it, it doesn't accurately describe how, how the ecosystem works across the schedule, which is effectively, we, you know, we need these commercial hits in your top right box. We all need them. But in, in, in the case of the public broadcasters, we need them in order to do extraordinary things that we also know the viewers want. And they may want that in slightly smaller numbers, but the whole system works together brilliantly. So again, you know, the, the, the economics of the companies that are making the tougher the tougher work by people actually quite often who are very happy to earn a reasonable salary doing tough work in a relatively small company. Um, that adds hugely to the, the, to the health and wealth of what we're all uh, culturally getting from the system. So I think, again, the balance between you know, the harder engines of IP and all of the other bits of the system needs to be kept yeah. in our minds as we have this debate. Just and a quick point from the back. I've been very patiently waiting. So it's, uh, ooh, bloody, sorry, that's loud. Oh, it's uh, Steve. Steve Hewlett, just briefly. I, I, I'm struggling slightly with some of this. Um, I, I can, it would be a terrible shame if, if Warner Brothers uh, ruined wall to wall. I grant you that. And that wouldn't be a net, you know, no, no great addition to road safety. But if they ruin wall to wall, someone else will step into the breach. More than likely, the people who do such sterling work in wall to wall will reappear in front of David Abrams' commissioners within months, uh, branded as Bob Breast Productions or something else. Surely, this system, given that nobody is able to dictate to the broadcasters who they buy from, this is self-correcting. 
If the process of consolidation leads to creative ruin, then creativity will re-emerge somewhere else. The, the broadcasters have the whip hand here. They can buy from whoever they choose. Unless David and the BBC wish to tell us now that the changing structure of the industry means that they effectively have their hands up their backs and have no choice about who to commission from. If Rupert Murdoch is now, by definition, the supplier of choice and there's nothing you can do about it, that would be a serious question. Otherwise, it seems to me, that on the production front, it is, in fact, largely self-correcting. One other question, if I may, on the terms of trade, can somebody scale the problem for me? At the bottom end, everyone seems to accept that small indies deserve and need protection uh, of the law in terms of contractual terms and so on. That has proved very successful. The BBC say they support it. David has said many times that he supports it. This is for small indies at the bottom. For big indies at the top, owned by broadcasters, they don't get protection of the terms of trade. But there's a lag. So the issue, but there's a lag. Well, there may be a lag, but it's yeah. up to you to get on and really get and do the proper thing in the light of in the interest of your stakeholders and start renegotiating. Because again, you do have the whip hand. But where's the problem in the middle? How big is the problem? What proportion of Channel 4 shows, for example, are supplied by big, powerful indies that still benefit from the terms of trade? Numerically, how big an issue is it? The whole series of statements there um, uh, ending in a question. Um, but look, the, it's all to do with if you look at this over time, because basically we are helping some of these companies, with us and the BBC, to go from small to medium and then from medium okay. to large. So you can't do a snapshot, but there have been, there, there was a bulge of companies in the middle who became quite big but were still qualifying. Um, and so there is a challenge in, you know, adjusting the definitions of what is qualifying and not qualifying that we could usefully be had, because it may well be the case that now all those medium-sized companies have been snapped up, but there'll be more coming through according to your self-correcting uh, model. So again, these are, these are modifications. As to the, to the whip hand issue, I think you're sort of going back to 20 years ago to the sort of, you know, kind of duopolistic kind of theory that underpinned the terms of trade, and clearly things have changed. I mean, we haven't talked at all in this uh, discussion about YouTube and, and all the other players that, that are coming in. Um, you know, th things are, you know, we are not in such a powerful position as we were, and therefore, concomitantly, there should be uh, a, a, re a revisit of the framework. Okay, well, on that note, um, we have to finish because we have coffee waiting. Um, Josh Sapan is on at 11 o'clock. Um, I'd like to thank very much the panel. I think uh, they've entertained us as well as um, informed us today. So uh, thank you very much to my panel. Well done. Well done, you.